Thank you, team. Sure, sure appreciate that. Hey, good morning. How's everybody? Good to see you today. So glad you're here. Thanks for coming to church. Thank you to those of you that are joining us online. Uh, you can go ahead and take your Bibles or your phones and open them to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be near the very front of the Bible. It'll take us a few moments to get there, but that's where we're heading. If you're new to second, the last couple of weeks, uh, what they just did is they sang Joy to the World. We're in a series called Joy to the World that's really been fun. What we've been doing is taking a verse of the song each week and then looking at the theological underpinnings behind that. Well, what, what does it really mean according to the Bible? And it's been, been a lot of fun. So the first week as Jeremy uh, talked about joy to the world, he reminded us, and this is so important, that there is a difference between joy and momentary happiness. Would you agree with that? Right? We can have joy even in the middle of a storm for believers, if Jesus is your rock. And he reminded us of that. Last week, I, I, I love this, because, you know, Joy to the World is probably the most uh, famous and popular Christmas song. But Tommy reminded us, in case you've never heard this, Joy to the World was not written as a Christmas song. It was not written as a Christmas song. It was written by a man named Isaac Watts, who had ruminated over and over and over again on Psalm 98 which is a story about having joy to the world about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if you begin to look at that more and more, Tommy reminded us of several things, but he showed us scripture after scripture that show us the position of Jesus that right now he's at the right hand of God, the, the strength of God interceding for us, and that one day, Christ will reign forever and ever. Amen. And that's the joy to the world. So that brings us to today. And here's our question that we want to answer today through today's sermon. And it's this, what robs us? What robs us of our joy? And how can we reclaim it? What robs us of joy in our life? And how can we reclaim it? So I love music, and I've been listening to a lot of Christmas music because we've been getting ready for this series, and of course I've listened to Joy to the World many, many, many times. And for me, I, I, I just love Christmas music, and we've long had a tradition at our house, even when our kids were babies and they're grown now with kids of their own, but one of the things I've always loved to do on Christmas morning is have Christmas music, but for me, I'm an old guy, for me... I love to have some of the greatest hits from Handel's Messiah. You say, man, you are really old. That's right, I am. And I love to have Handel's Messiah playing. And uh, sincerely, for me, there is nothing better on Christmas morning than a busy house, Christmas gifts being open, but the beauty of the Hallelujah Chorus. Where, where it begins to ring through our home as presents are being opened and we're thinking about Jesus, where it says, King of kings, hallelujah, hallelujah, and Lord of lords, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then it says, and he shall reign forever and ever. I, I get chills just thinking about the hallelujah chorus right now. So I've been listening to that. Now, on the other hand, I've been listening to some other Christmas songs to get ready for this series, and there are some strange ones out there, can I just tell you? I mean, Grandma got run over by a reindeer, right? Walking home from our house Christmas Eve, you may say there's no such thing as Santa, but as for me and Grandpa, we believe. And you know what troubles me? Some of you said that with no problem at all. You knew that song really well. And then I think about this. Who is good King Winchelus, and why is he concerned about the Feast of Stephen? If you've ever heard that song, what is that even about? And then the one that makes me really chuckle, has anybody here really honestly ever asked someone else for figgy pudding? Anybody? <laughs> I've never asked anyone. And then it says, we won't go until we get some. Can you imagine standing on someone's doorstep and saying that? I mean, that's, that's trespassing, right? So... And here's one, one last little one. There's a Christmas meme going around about the little drummer boy that I have seen that just cracked me up. Take, take a look at it. 
It says, Mary, exhausted, having just gotten Jesus to sleep, is approached by a young man who thinks to himself, what this girl needs is a drum solo. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Now, the reason that I bring up those silly and obscure lyrics is because today we're going to study the Bible story behind an often forgotten verse to joy to the world. It's verse 3, and most churches, if you go to a Christmas Eve service, don't even sing it. It's skipped over. But if they do sing it, most people don't even know what it means. But Jack and the team just sang verse 3, and in case you don't know, you sang it with them. But it doesn't sound like a Christmas song to most. Here's what it says. Look at what it says. It says, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Doesn't sound Christmassy, does it? He comes to make his blessings flow, for as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. The rare, verse 3, to joy to the world. What in the world does this mean, and what's the connection to Christmas? Well, it's a strange verse, but I believe more than anything else, that verse is both a warning light of danger and a lighthouse of truth all rolled up into one. And why do I say that? To put it bluntly, verse 3 of Joy to the World is a flashback to probably one of the most pivotal chapters in all the Bible. It's Genesis chapter 3, where I've just asked you to turn. Hope your Bibles are open there. Now, to give you a ramp up, Genesis chapter 3 is known as the fall of man. And what does that mean? It means in the very beginning, you know how the Bible opens, right? God created the heavens and the earth. That's how the Bible opens. And everything was perfect and good. And then God created man. We know him as Adam. And then God said it was very good that he had created man. And at that very moment when man was created in this perfect environment, there was joy in the world. But as you're going to see in just a moment, Adam and then Eve, we're going to hear about her. They were in this perfect environment. But because of their choices, the whole human race, including you and including me, would then become under the curse that we just talked about in verse 3 of Joy to the World. But let's do a little rewind before we do a fast forward. Now, the ramp up here is right after God created man, Adam, he does two very important things in chapter 2. So I'm going to go back to a couple of verses in chapter 2. I want to read it, but let's look at what God does after he creates this perfect environment. Verse 15 of chapter 2. This will be on our screens. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here is introduced the famous tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By the way, it's not an apple tree. Sometimes people say apple tree. That's nowhere in the Bible that it's an apple tree, but it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then verse 18 says this. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, and I will make a helper fit for him. So God creates Eve, or woman. He takes the rib from Adam and he puts them together in the perfect Garden of Eden. And this beautiful chapter ends this way is the setup. You've heard it at almost every wedding you've ever been to. Let me read verse 24. Look at how it ends. It says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, naked and not ashamed. So that's kind of the setup to where we're going to go. So the first thing I want to point out before I even get into the, the sermon is this. First point, we have ultimate joy when we are living in the will of God. Don't miss that, Christians in the room. You want to know how to have joy, follow God. Do what God says. 
That's what was going on in this environment when God created Adam and ultimately Eve. They were under the umbrella of the will of God. So first God creates Adam. He was in this perfect environment, all food taken care of, all shelter taken care of, no stress, no anger, no sickness, no worrying about where's my next paycheck coming from so we can eat, getting to name every animal. It was utopia. There was joy in the world. And then notice, God wants to increase the joy of Adam, and so he creates Eve. And I love this. God performs the first wedding ceremony right there at the end of chapter 2. Talk about a joyful event. Notice that Adam and Eve were naked, and they were not ashamed of it. And that means not only the physical part of marriage, but also they were both joyfully and fully vulnerable with each other. No secrets No concerns about body image, no pouting, no lying, no deceit, nothing but joy in the world. But I want to say something here, and this is really so important. Don't miss this if you miss everything else I say. Please notice that also part of God's perfect and joyful environment for them included restrictions for their own good. Does that make sense? God said, here's this one thing I don't want you to do, and it is for your own good. So church, let me say this, right? We would all agree that God's freedoms in our lives are for our own good. Amen, right? The freedoms God gives us, but also God's restrictions in our lives, when he says, don't do this or that, are also for our own good. And it should make us joyful that God is protecting us when he says, don't do this. Laurie and I are very blessed to get to keep our grandson some during the week. And he's all boy, and he's a cute kid, and we love him so much. And what he loves more than anything else is he loves to be outside. And he wants to be outside playing, and he goes up and down our driveway. And he goes all the way up and down, plays constantly. And we have told him, you can play on the driveway as long as Lolly and Pops are watching, but you cannot go into the street. You cannot go into the street. Don't don't go past there. You cannot go into the street. And one of the things I love is he loves to take anything with wheels, a truck, a stroller, uh, anything he can find, and he takes it and he pushes it and he pushes them into the street, but he stands back and watches like this. (laughs) He knows that he can't go over but he watches other things sail into the street. And there's just something about human nature which says we're going to test boundaries. But he's learned that our restrictions for him are for his good. So listen to me. The same is true of you and me. Being in the will of God, even with God's restrictions, will bring us joy. But... Stepping out of God's restrictions will bring us pain, will bring us pain. So here's a question I have for everybody before I go further. Are you right now living in the will of God? Are you right now experiencing joy in your life because you know I'm under the umbrella of God and I'm doing what he says? Or truthfully, are you experiencing a lack of joy somewhere in your life because you're choosing to step out of the will of God? Let's read on. The plot thickens. Now chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, remember that, lest you die. So friends, can I just say something here? You know the story, right? The serpent 
is representative of the evil one, of Satan. And, and I want us to see that how he works on people first is this, right between the ears. Do you see that? He offers up a suggestion and says, hey, why don't you doubt God? He plants a thought saying, God is some type of cosmic killjoy. God, God doesn't want the best for you. God's holding something back from you, which was not true. And notice, notice, even for good measure, Eve was already confused because of the enemy's temptation. Because God did tell them, don't eat of the tree, but God never said, don't touch it. She was already confused. Downfall is coming. Let's read about the downfall. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. I always repeat this right here for the men that miss this. Her husband, who was with her, was with her. Passive leadership, charged with leading his home and family, and stood by and watched this event took place, and then he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and so I ate. Pause right here. See the blame game? He did it. She did it. He did it. Folks, I don't want to sound overly dramatic but I, but I want everybody to see this for people that love the Bible and love God's Word. This moment in time that I just read about is where the world changed forever. Did you know that? This is the fall of man. This is the moment where a three-letter word entered into the culture and entered into the vocabulary. And the three-letter word is sin. This is a moment where joy to the world was lost. What causes us to lose our joy even today? Choosing sin. That's what happened at this very moment. This is where the curse of sin enters the world. So, here's the second observation I want to share with you today. We are robbed of our joy when we choose sin over obedience. That's exactly what happened here. You see that? We are robbed of our own joy when we say, I know better than God. I will do what I want to do because God doesn't want the best for me or God doesn't understand. And so I will choose to sin. And when that happens, we lose our joy. Let me be clear. Adam and Eve's willful choice changed their destiny, and it changed yours and mine. Sin is the number one joy robber. So after deliberately sinning, remember what I just read, Adam and Eve instantly knew something was wrong. We're naked. Their joy was lost. They were embarrassed at that moment. They went from being totally free and full in their relationship with God and in their relationship in their marriage to totally void of joy, to beginning to cover up and blame each other and blame the serpent for the mess that they were in. And I thought about that and I thought that's so true in all of our lives and it has long-lasting 
ramifications, even little bitty stories. I was thinking this week about a moment in time when I was in first grade, and that was a long time ago for me. When I was in first grade in this town and school, believe it or not, even though I became a school teacher, I didn't like school when I was a little kid. I was lazy. I didn't want to work hard. And so I was in first grade. And back then, they gave you a reader for each class. It wasn't the internet or news articles. You had the first grade reader. And I hated it. I didn't want to read it at all. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And the teacher pulled me aside one day because I wasn't doing my work. And she said, Mark, you're not, you're not reading your stuff. And I said, huh, you know, just kind of made some excuse. And she said, you know what? I want you to take this reader home to your mom because I know your mom, and she will read it with you, and she will help you. And you know what I did at that moment? I lied through my teeth. I said, I said, you don't know my mom. She won't help me with anything. She won't do anything. Now, those of you that know my mom, you know how funny that is because she would move mountains to do anything for one of her kids. And I spent the rest of that day worrying, is she going to find out? Is mom going to find out? Is the teacher? Well, the teacher knew right away that I was lying. And my mom found out later, and it was disappointing to her. And it just reminded me of a little bitty story from a seven-year-old guy standing here before you today saying, there are consequences for all of us in trying to hide and not do what God wants us to do. There's consequences And that's what was going on at this moment in time in this story, this fork in the road when they chose sin. Now, as the story continues, then like all of us, instead of them turning directly to God and saying, we were wrong, help us, restore us, they tried their own way to fix the problem and hide and cover up their sin. They sewed these fig leaves together because of their nakedness as if the God of the universe didn't know what was going on with them. Let's, let's read on and let's see what happens as the story unfolds. Down to verse 14. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and on your dust and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And the next verse, verse 15, should be a star and underlined verse. This next verse is absolutely dripping with rich theology. Let me read it to you. He says to the serpent, to the devil, to the evil one, I will put enmity between you and the woman, or conflict between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You say, well, what does that mean, Mark? It means this. What God was saying as he looked at the serpent, at the evil one, at Satan, and he said, Satan, you are a marked man. There will be strife for the rest of your days between your followers and ultimately the offspring of this woman And the ultimate offspring of this woman through the lineage would be Jesus Christ, the Savior, who comes at Christmas time to bring us joy to the world. And then look at this imagery. God says, yes, Satan, you're going to get in some punches on the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Kind of like you'll be nipping at his heel, but make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ will bruise your head. He will destroy you by the cross, and there will be a fatal blow to Satan's influence. Do you see it, church? Can we just say amen to that right now? Verse 15 is a pivotal scripture in the life of believers. Let's read on. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And he said to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Here's part of the curse. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Here it comes. Thorns and thistles. Verse 3 Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face or the sweat of your brow you may have learned. 
You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Pause. Tough, tough consequences. God says to Adam and Eve, thorns are going to infest the ground, just like what we just sang. Eating won't be easy. Childbearing will be painful. And because of this curse, every person on planet Earth has a funeral coming where their body will return to dust. Let me just say this right now. Let me put it as bluntly but as kindly as I can say this. Friends, God will allow us to suffer consequences to see that there is no joy in turning away from him. Can I say that again? God will allow you and God will most certainly allow me to suffer consequences, our own consequences, when we choose to say, I'm going to do it my way. My way is better than God's way. Powerful consequences. Listen to me. God loves you very much, but God will allow you and allow me individually, even as churches, cities, communities, nations, to suffer the consequences of sin. And ultimately, God wants us to realize that our only hope for true joy in the world is to cling to Jesus Christ and nothing less. You know, Tommy used the phrase last week, and it's such a true phrase, that we live in a sin-sick world, and that is a fact. We live in a sin-sick world. But for believers in this room and believers online, when we see the sin-sickness of this world, it's an opportunity for us to hold up Jesus and say, there is joy to the world, and it comes only from Christ. When we see destruction all around us, you name it, I could name several things, not valuing all human life, the evils of racism, a lack of concern for the poor, personal pride, or just a general sense of saying, I won't do what God wants me to do. When believers see those things, it's an opportunity for us to hold up Jesus and say that he is the answer for this mess that we are in. Amen? Well, that strange verse 3 that I just had on the screens of joy to the world says this near the very end. No more let sin and sorrow grow. And then it says at the very end, he comes to make his blessings flow. And you may say, how in the world do blessings flow out of this chapter in the Bible that is so wrought with punishment? And there's one verse, verse 21. It's another star underlined. This is a pivotal verse in the Bible. And here's what it says. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And you may be going, huh? Well, what's the big deal? So God saw that they were naked and he covered him. That is not the story. That is not the story. Don't miss this. What happens in verse 21 is that God sheds innocent blood to cover sin. That's called the gospel. God shed innocent blood to cover sin. And that was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do in the New Testament on the cross. So, we've talked about the joy robber, but what restores our joy? Here's the final point I want to make. It's this. Our joy is restored, listen, when we choose the cross over the curse. The curse is sin. When I choose to sin, as the saying goes, I will choose to suffer. And you've been through that, and most certainly I have as well. 
Our joy is restored when we choose the cross, the message of the gospel over the curse of sin. Friends, you can have joy in any situation, no matter how good or how bad it is. Life, money, marriage, divorce, singleness, kids, health, trauma. When we choose to say, Jesus Christ dying on the cross, praise God that's for my salvation to go to heaven someday. Yes, it is. But Jesus Christ dying on the cross gives me the power and the strength not to choose the curse today. To choose hope in Christ. I was thinking about that hope in Jesus when the world is falling apart. And this past week I was reminded of the old Bill Gaither song called There's Something About That Name. And for me, it took on a whole new meaning. This past Monday, I saw a link online that a pastor had shared. This video was a man who had lost almost his entire home in last weekend's deadly tornadoes that went through Kentucky and Arkansas and Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi. And even though all hope had been lost in this man's life, his piano had remained unharmed. And he sat in what used to be his house that didn't exist anymore, playing the song, There's Something About That Name, which has these words. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Take a look. You know, that was so moving when I saw that. And I thought the truth is, that's a metaphor for what we're going through right now in all of our lives. We are in a mess in this world. And the world is falling down all around us. But there is an anchor who holds through the storms of night. Jesus Jesus, Jesus, there's something about his name. I don't know what you're dealing with today. Your life may be great today, or you may be in a hole. But I know this about you and me. Storms are coming. Everybody has storms in their life. And I know this. When they come, we don't have to choose the curse. We can choose the cross. That's why verse 3 says... He comes to make blessings flow far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. And when we choose the cross, there will be joy to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you even for Christmas songs in this season like joy to the world that remind us of how good you are. God, I pray right now for each one of us. We all struggle. We all sin. I pray, God, beginning with me, that you would help us to turn to the cross and not choose the curse. And, Lord, I pray if there are those with us, even right now in this service or watching online, 
who maybe they know about Christmas songs, maybe they know about church, but they've never turned their life over Jesus to Jesus Christ to be saved. I pray that that would happen right now, that your Holy Spirit would tug at their heart and they would turn to you and say, there is only one way to have joy in this world and it's through Jesus. I pray that even right now. Thank you, God, for your goodness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.